All right, we love, we live. We is live. A baby for who the is your favorite warrior, brother Black Panther in the building with my illustrious clan, Massey Warrior clan. Spirits is flying, pseudos is crying in the building with brother Kofi, brother Sean P, AKA Eni Heret. So, you know, we in the building today going over some African art, going over some, you know, some customs and traditions. We're going to get into some mask, man. And, you know, this is a topic that we're probably going to revisit multiple times just because, you know, it's never, it's never over. You're never going to find the last mask. You know, you're never going to find the last piece of African art. You're never going to find, you know, the last piece of the tradition that connects it all together. So it's something that we're going to do over and over again. It's kind of, it's kind of going to be like a series now that I think about it. You know, I did a presentation on African masks probably two years ago, and these brothers have done presentations on masks since then. So it's going to be something we continue to do, continue to do. I have a huge book on masks at home, uh, that I need to crack open. So this is gonna be continue, continue to do, and hopefully it will get people interested to research their culture in full. Not just the, the you know, the, the Orishas or not just the Netas or not just the Abuzums, but the symbolism behind those iconic names and, and natural forces. When you talk about the natural forces, the art is embedded in the natural forces, you know? That's that's a part of it. It's no separation. The mask, you know, in cultures of Africa are very, very, very important. So we definitely want to bring this to the forefront to the people. As you know, we focused on Africa. We're, Afri we're African-centered, you know? So go ahead and kick it off, Brother Kofi. Go ahead and show us what you got, and uh, we'll roll from there, man. Appreciate everybody tuning in. All right, all right, Alafia, Alafia, eBay. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, right there, one. Uh, hold on. Let me try and pull it up. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. Hold on. Give me one sec. All right. Well, this is uh. My little smile presentation here. I'm gonna uh, set it up for the uh, for my two other brothers, my uh, brothers to go uh, to go in. This is a uh, mask. Mask is the African way of life reloaded. This is some of the uh, slides from my African mask way way of life presentation with a few other slides in here. So some of these slides may be a little bit familiar. Uh, before I get started, this is something that we always do. This is a phrase that we do before we do presenting the information. This is our phrase. Let's go to war. So I'm gonna amp y'all up real quick. I'm gonna 
All right, so uh, let's go to war. Now, I ain't gonna video y'all to death, but I want to play one more little thing just to try to get y'all in the mood. Also, I think this is pretty dope. I played this last time, so I think y'all enjoy this to kind of get y'all in the mood for what we got in store. <laughs> I just want to try to, you know, play that video a little bit. I just get y'all into it. I think it was pretty dope. But all right. Uh, family. In African mass is a way of life. There has been many of uh, many own people as well as other groups down talking African mass saying things like the mass are ugly, demonic, or evil, or evil looking. The mass for designs for the purpose to ward off evil spirits prevent ill health preventing disasters bringing rain bringing children to merit married couples ceremonies rituals policies governments social control communities affairs initiations and sometimes uh, entertainment so this is why i say that african uh mask is a way of life because the african mask is incorporated and everything that our ancestors did it is presence in everything that we do all right makers of the mass let's start first with the mass makers and the mass makers is a special educated person who is respected and feared by his tribe and had, uh, for his understanding and the spiritual world the artist training can last for many years through either an apprentice slash mentor relationship or by skills that are passed down from father uh <clears throat> excuse me to son so here uh just reiterating it says uh that the artist is, has uh trained may be trained for for many years also it says that the uh where it said that uh he's educated and respected and feared by his tribe for understanding the spiritual world so keep that in mind as we continue to build with the mass that the mass maker is very skilled in the spiritual world oh shoot hold on y'all let me let me enlarge this too i'm sorry that should be better all right sorry about that all right 
every mask made according to strict rules they believe that the material they work with is in uh every color and shape has power this power directed the artist's work the masks are made of bone ivory metal fiber leather most often wood the uh they may naturally or extract using bold geometric shapes they can represent qualities such as nobility beauty or uh humorous so i tried to display uh some of the material what the masks are made uh made out of uh and you can see a lot of the masks here i have like a lot of geometric similar uh, symmetrics uh checkerboard uh and zigzag um uh designs on the mask as well as core shells bones and etc hey brother kofi before you go to the next slide that last mask okay. on the go back right, one. Go ahead. okay i'm here the last mask yeah. on the right i actually have that mask in my home uh i purchased it here? In no on the well my right let me see <laughs> okay. core shell yes uh i actually bought that mask in senegal the uh person that sold it to me told me it came from the ivory coast and uh yeah that that mask is actually in my home and actually comes with like a tail that goes down the back of it uh with some type of hair that's in the back it's a it's a very big mask i know it doesn't look that big from right here but it but it goes over your head like a helmet right can i get that yeah mm -hmm. just wanted to point that out there oh uh, i was asking can i get the mask can you get the ma man what <laughs> boy <laughs> he said can i get that <laughs> boy you crazy man. all right all right and all this trained by wood carving we're still talking about the mask makers so an artist trained by the wood carving makes the mask. Doing apprentice, hold on, let me find my see if I okay. An artist trained by wood carving makes the mask. Doing an apprenticeship, the artist learn about the particular style and the masks that are important to his own community. The mask carver is always male and in his important status among his people. Yes, the mask makers are held in the highest esteem uh, in their community. Uh, the mask is often made from a single piece of wood. The artists use an X X light tool called the Adas to create features features on the mask. But let me go back when it says a single piece of mask. We know that the mask are made out of so many different things: brass, uh, uh, copper, uh, wood, raphael, which comes from the palm tree, other different materials. Um, but going back to the wood, these mask makers um they make the mask now before they cut and we know the trees are plentiful uh in the homeland so majority of the masks are made out of the wood masses uh in particular than the other different uh items that i named on the previous slides now when they get ready i talked about this in uh my african uh way of life presentation as well as my african drums presentation uh drums is the heartbeat of the community i think that's the title of it but Anyway, I talk about how uh, those um, uh, what they would call blacksmiths or other different things, um, they will actually cut the tree before they got ready to cut the trees down to make the drums or make the woods or so forth. They would actually pour libations, uh, make us a, a offering uh, to the tree because, again, we believe everything uh on the, uh everything uh has in, uh, possessed energy whether it's animated or an, an uh, in, animated or inanimated energy so they will pour libations and uh and um 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 make an offering uh to the tree and ask the tree for forgiveness because they understood that the tree possessed this spiritual it has a spiritual soul uh as well so they will make an offering and pour libations and uh before they uh actually uh cut the tree down to start to carve the mask i just wanted to throw that out there fine details are carved and the mask is using am i correct uh brother ben say brother one, benjamin 
Oh, I was asking. I'm, I'm correct, right? Say it again. You kind of cut out on my. I was, I was letting the I was letting the family know that uh, and I've shared this information before. Um, previous to them actually cutting the trees down, because particularly uh, most of the mask was made out of uh, wood, but it's made out of other different things. But particularly, the masks were made out of wood, and before the mask makers would even attempt to cut the tree down to make the wood. They will pour libations and make an offering to the tree and ask the tree for forgiveness before they did anything because they understood that everything on this plane of existence is alive. And they said that, the, I mean, our ancestors believe that the spirit, the, uh, the tree has a soul uh, as well. Correct. Yes, that's correct. But it, uh, the only thing I want to touch on with that statement is it's not more forgiveness as it is permission. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, 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 yeah. You have to get permission from that energy to do what you do. Uh, so you know, forgiveness would be more like you know, we gonna do this anyway. <laughs> you know, no matter what this says, you know. But yeah. uh, but permission involves uh, divination, involves incantations, involves prayers, involves libations, and guess what? If the energy of that tree says no, guess what? You got to find another tree. Right, right. <laughs> All right. Fine details are carved on uh, masks using knives, the dark, uh, or add colors to the wood. An artist may soak the mask in mud, burn it, rub it with oil, or paint it with a natural pigment or a manufactured wood stain. An artist will often make the mask uh, in private. After the artist completes the mass, an elder will perform a ceremony to allow the spirit to inhabit the mass and gives it power. Likewise, when a mass is no longer in use, the elder performs a ceremony to remove the power um, from the mass. Mass can be grouped into three main uh, forms, face mask, helmet mask, and headdresses. The face mask is most common form of usual curves over the masker faces stop right before the ears. Other face masks often described as a plank mask or completely flat. A helmet mask covers the entire head, sits on the shoulder of the masker. The third form of the mask and the headdress rests on top of the mask masker head to help keep the masker identity disguised. A costume made out of raphael or grass to attach to the head of uh, the headdress or to cover his or her face. Some mask type shapes of, of humans. The mask often have stylish features to represent ideals of beauty and strength. Other masks take forms of powerful animals that is important to the community, such as an elephant, an antelope, a hawk. Sometimes mass combine, uh, combines uh, at attributes from different animals or even com combine humans and animal features. When these features are brought together on a mass, the power of each are combined. The mask is a variety of sizes. Sometimes they are very small, just large enough to cover the mask's face. Other times they are extremely large or tall. For example, the Bawa mask below is six feet tall the mask must be strong to maintain his balance while wearing such a mask and i forgot to put that mask uh up here all right the masks are often decorated with such things animal hair or straw for hair or beards or animal horns animal teeth feathers and seashell so here i'm trying to show a depiction of what i was talking about for is, um the animal hair, the animal teeth, uh, uh, feathers, and seashells. Masks are usually designed to appear human or animal or a combination of the two. The horns represent a uh, millet, legs, roots, and plants, while ear representing songs that women sing in the harvest. Now, I made a statement earlier in one of the slides. A lot of people that doesn't understand our culture and understand the masses may look at some of these masks that I showed on a previous slide and maybe some of the masks that uh, uh, Aru Kurini uh, 
uh, any uh, Sean Calfani or Akorini, um, uh Benjamin Njai may show. Some of these masses is not made to look pretty. Some of these masses are designed for specifically uh, uh, for, for certain reasons. And I show uh, on, on a few slides um, back what are some of these uh, uh, masks are particularly made for. Now, this mask here, we talk about this mask is uh, particularly worn by um, the women. You see the horn, you know, uh, in our culture, we don't we don't we don't we don't believe in the devil. <laughs> so this this uh, particular mask, it represents um, uh, the growth of the mullet, which gives um, gives you um, dough and also gives you beer. And this mask in particular are worn by the women uh doing the uh doing the uh doing the uh harvest time all right sack of uh, uh scarification women and men get scarification marks that will dis dis distinguish her or him from anyone else tell her his or rank and society family clans and tribes or symbolize her beauty and strength and some african tribes it was like wearing your identity card on your face true some may hate that but this was a mark of pride, not shame. And I know a lot of times we'll see uh, some of our brothers over there on the continent, or some of our sisters over there on the continent that may have these scarification marks um, uh, on their face. They may have some of the unwear, which will be on their forehead, some of the scarification marks, which may be on the side of their face, and some of the scarification marks they may be on their abdomen. The, the ones that we see on the face, it's particularly for puberty. We know that uh, our ancestors and our brothers on the uh, continent uh, deals with the rites of passages. So the puberty rites of passage is particularly dealing with when you see the, the uh, scarifications on the forehead, scarf scarifications on the side of the face may be a rites of, 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 of puberty. Uh, I mean, uh, um, of childhood excuse me of childhood then you may hear you may see on the abdomen area the scarification it may be a rice of passage of a woman or a man uh coming into uh any uh in adulthood and a lot of these uh these these scarification marks or identities for different uh different ethnic groups you know to identify what tribe or clan or society um that you may come from um in most african culture it was a major artistic culture component as it can be seen as a mask in the museums around the world scarification patterns on masks are not only marks of beauty but marks of one lineage as well and in some cases protection against evil spirits scarification were more visible on dark-skinned people than to say tattoos scarification is long painful process and a permanent modification of the body transmitting complex messages about identities and social status. Permanent body markings emphasize social, political, and religious roles, beauties, and complex design depends on the artist's skills, but also on a person's tolerance of pain. Facial scarification in West Africa was used to use for identifications of ethnic groups, families, individuals, but also expresses beauty. And, you know, and I, I talked about that as identification mark, but it also uh represents beauty and i know a lot of times we'll see the brothers and the sisters with these markings on their face and we'll ask why um our brothers and sisters over there are messing up their faces by putting scar scars on their face or on their bodies and some societies these scarifications are represented as uh as beauty uh were through to beauty to the body. It was also performed on girls to mark stages of life in, in puberty as well as marriages. They also get these in the rites of marriages. Uh, 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 I mean, the rat, uh, marriage rite also. All right. These are some of the masks here that have the scarification marks on them. The, the masks have scarification marks on them. As I stated earlier, you will see the scarification marks on the forehead you'll see the scarification marks on the side of the face. The scarifications on the side of the face and on the forehead are particularly in some societies and cultures and clans are, are, are childhood. You get these uh, as a child. Uh, you have 
other marks that may be on the adenum, which I didn't show anything on the adenum because we're dealing with with the mask. But I, you know, I wanted to throw that in for as the stomach area. Those are when you are becoming a uh, coming adult. So I wanted to show you that also that the scarification rights that our uh, that our ancestors and the brothers, our brothers and sisters on the continent use the scarification marks are also on these masks. So when you see these masks with these scar, I mean with these masks with these markings, these are scarification marks. They may represent a rights of uh, a childhood. It may uh, rights of an adulthood, or it may uh, exemplify uh, a beauty or identification mark for some type of tribe or clan that you may be. Uh, may be a part of all right african masks are considered amongst the finest creation in art in the art world and uh, are highly sought after by art collections many of the pieces some relics can be reviewed in museums and art galleries in many parts of the world masking ceremonies in africa have great cultures and traditional significance latest developments of understanding the artistic principles religious and ceremony values have brought about a great insight into the ideals of moral val values and African uh, art expressions uh, in their art. And these are just two things why I, I, I snatched up where our ancestors are um, masks or art was in these museums. And they try to uh, get you to, uh, uh, to demonize your ancestors' um, artwork and say that they are, are, are works of the heathens. Uh, these are pagan, they're pagan works. Uh, they are satanic, they are evil. And some of these masks, like I said earlier, they are utilized for a particular uh, reason. They are utilized to, uh, let's go back and see real quick and then I'll, I'll be through and I'll pass it on to, uh, pass it on to my uh, other brothers. But you know, they are used to ward off evil. They are used to prevent ill health. They are used to prevent disasters, bring rain, bring children to married couples. They are used in ceremonies, rituals, policing, government, social control, community affairs, initiation, and sometimes entertainment. I say that African mask is a way of life. We incorporate uh, uh, the masks and everything uh, that we do. So that concludes uh, my little short presentation. I just wanted to touch on real quick what the masks are made out of, uh, who makes the mask, which are the men are the ones that particularly uh, makes the mask. The men are the ones that particularly wear the masks, but you have an exception with the uh, Sandy Bundo uh, uh, Society, Secret Woman, means the Secret Woman Society. And this is uh, uh, particularly uh, Sierra Leone, uh Liberia uh so forth dealing with the Mindy people uh uh the Basa the Kono uh the Kisi and a few other ethnic groups that uh particularly deal with the secret woman society as well as the Poro uh uh um society but the women are allowed to wear the mask uh uh in that and the uh I can't remember exactly what the masquerade is called, but the leader of the Sandy Bundo Society is the Zo Zoe. If you want more information on that, just uh, later on today, if you got some time, uh, stick on the channel and just go to that uh, presentation, the Sandy uh, Bundo Secret Woman Society. But that's all I had just to try to set up uh, for the other brothers. I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, I'm gonna come back to that later on. All right. Let me stop sharing my screen. Other fantastic pictures. Yeah, yeah, I tried to catch them. Um, some good pictures. Hold on, let me stop sharing. All right, Kofi, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, we can see. Let's let's get it in, man. Appreciate that uh, setup, Kofi. By the way, and uh, Lafayette to the family, everyone tuned in. Uh, we're going to continue to build on what Kofi has already uh, laid down. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in again. We're going to 
I'm oh, the second he part of this. Boss mask on the front. <laughs> Thought you were gonna slip it by me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I had to put the Mossy mask on there, man. Let's get into it, guys. So uh Africa is it's considered to be the cradle of human ancestry from which we may all trace our descent. Based on the evidence to date, most scientists concur that humankind evolved and modern humans emerged on the African continent. Recent discoveries of cultural artifacts dating back to 70,000 years also suggest that the earliest forms of visual expression may be found in Africa. For many thousands of years, Africans have contributed to the cultural heritage of the world, creating masterful works of astonishing innovation and creativity. Today, over 680 million people live in Africa. Although some regions remain sparsely inhabited, others are densely populated. The West African nation of Nigeria, for example, has one fifth of the entire continent's population. About a third of all Africans live in the large cities such as Lagos, Nigeria, the, continent, the continent's most populous city within 13.5 million people. Other major urban centers in contemporary Africa include Cairo, Kanisha, the Republic of Congo, of course, Ibadan, uh, Dakar, uh, Johannesburg, which is Cape Town, Pretoria, and the majority of Africans, however, live in more rural areas where their long agricultural activities. Two of the main forces have exerted substantial influence on the design of African masks. One, social and religious beliefs of the community were generally manifested in the design of African masks as a tradition. Uh, the individual vision of the mask designer also greatly influences the style of the mask. African tribal artists do not try to create a perfect representation of their subject. Although some realistic portraits are made, others celebrate more abstract qualities like nobility, beauty, courage, mischief, and humor. They created an idolized version emphasizing those elements that they consider most important. What I want people to realize is um, our ancestors did an excellent job on expressing themselves through art. And if you get numerous museums all over the world, even as far as Australia, through Europe, on back to the Western world. These places harnessed exhibits full of Western, uh, of African art, period, point blank. And in some cases, or a lot of times, most cases, they'll have more African art than they will have of their own culture in these museums. So we're going to get right into the uh, Buffalo Mask for dancers in honor of the ancestral spirits. To the right, we have the imagery. It looks like it couldn't have been difficult to make, but if you ever sat down and you tried to get into trying to carve out a mask, it could be very difficult. Now, this mask is expressive Buffalo Mask of the Mumoyi, if I said that correct, from the northeast of Nigeria, south of the Banu River carved from light, light wood and red with red wood powder, white culling and black soot dyed. Now with two horns in the mask and a big open mouth in the front, this type of helmet or cap mask is worn horizontally on top of the head. The mask dancer performs in a full bite, long plant fibers at the annual two day ceremonies and dances in honor of the dead and ancestral spirits. An old piece with small age related eruptions at the bottom, as well as good use patina, especially on the side, it's on the head of the dance. It's normally 19 centimeters, 50 centimeters long, and it was created in the first half of the 20th century. Here's some additional information on this particular mask. Now, Carla says of Cape Town, South Africa, now has it in a private collection in uh in germany y'all it's a german private collection is where you can find this mask you also can auction for it or pay for it and uh they will sell you this mask their own culture back to you pretty much um now 
It's some more information that was found on this mask, and I have it highlighted right here for anyone who want to go back during this build. Pause the video right here at additional information, and it'll give you a page number, the book, and so forth to find more information. Can I get a GoFundMe to buy back our mask? <laughs> right. We need Just go it. www.getourshitback.com. Because you want you want to see, man. Um, if you go on uh, uh, the auction, the uh, if you type in African mask auction, man, you will see, man, our ancestors are art all over the place, man. I mean, they sell them for high end, man. I mean, ten to fifteen to twenty, they going for like twenty thousand dollars, man. They just they getting rich off, man, off uh, off our stuff, man. Man, yeah. I seen. Uh, you know, I don't know if the. Uh, Audience, or you brothers are familiar with the uh, Ikinga uh, figurines. They're out of Igbo land, and Ikinga is similar to Ogun in uh, Yoruba tradition. So they make figurines of Ikingas. And I saw online, uh, it was a private collector, a uh, white guy. He was selling them for like 1900 bucks. And those were the small ones. The big ones, he was selling for 20000 Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. We just got robber. Right. <laughs> what they take? They just took these masks. <laughs> right. All right. So we have one from Ijo, Nigeria. What we have on the front screen to our, our right uh, for the viewership. Um, it is a pair of two pieces, antelope masks, male and female, black and white color. I want to read two pieces, male and female, white color, antelope mask. Okay, the Ijo live mainly as fishermen in the Niger Delta in southern Nigeria. Therefore, this uh, their masks are mostly water spirits, Awu, which after the presentation of the Ijo hover over the water surface. They occur at um, Washagis festivals or king and are said to promote fertility, especially of fish. They are not worn in front of the uh, mask dancer's face, but as a cap or a helmet mask on top of the head. Also, this pair of antelope masks called Agria or Ajobo belong to the water spirit mask because antelopes are often on the banks of the rivers and lagoons and are considered good swimmers. The dancers wear the mask horizontally on their heads, often widening water up to their necks. This pair of antelope mask of the Ejo is called from hard brother black and white with one pair each horns reaching far back. The mask with the smooth horns represent the male antelope, those with the two horns, the female. Both are colored black outside and inside, only the upper tips of the horns with the pointed over eyes with rows of teeth are white. Both are rare objects, bear signs of use, slightly chip edges and points, as well as good older gloss patina outside and inside. Some additional information regarding the mask. Now, this also was created on the first half of the 20th century. The pointed over eyes and the open snouts with rows or teeth are white. Both the objects bear signs of use, slightly chip edges, as well as a good older gloss patina outside and inside. Now the mask are 74 centimeters in height, 72 centimeters in length. First half, again, this is on the first half of the 20th century the, um, where you actually can see this and you should be good to go. If you want to pause this for additional information, you can. I have it on the screen. You can buy it back for $2,400. All right, now we have the donations. We need them donations. Right. Y'all gave, gave everything. I'm gonna need them donations for the mask. Now I'm just playing with y'all, family. <laughs> <laughs> now on the screen we have the Ibo Izzy, the night of Nigeria, an elephant mask, Akbodo Inyi. Now I want y'all to take a pretty good look at this mask before I even start explaining the mask. As you can see, the front, the frontal of the mask, and then you see like some horns to the top but those are actually the heads so uh way 
of expressing the people in this particular area. So the Igbo Easy, a supergroup of the Igbo, of the Igbo settlement area in southeastern Nigeria, have produced this mask type Akbodo Ingi, uh, elephant spirit. Akbodo Ingi is actually an essay mask. It is worn horizontally on the head of the mask dancer with a pad made of soft fiber, uh, fiber fabric. Formerly, Agbodo Inye is a composite mask of part of various animals. You have the tusk of an elephant, uh, the elephant always pointed forward, then the mouth of the hippopotamus, followed by the paws of the warthog. That's why I asked y'all to look at the mask closely. The protruding projection of the forehead of the mask is interpreted as the elephant's trunk, etc. Agbodo Inye is considered a good natured, helpful being, a friend of the village who protects people. These Akbodo Inge masks belong to members of a men's federation of Igbo Izzy. This men's federation is organized in age groups. The older and more significant the mask is made, uh, male convenient. Now, the bigger his uh, elephant mask. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, some additional information regarding this particular mask is uh, the presented big elephant ghost mask shows a considerable age. It is carved from heavy hardwood. The surface is dissolved in relief areas, alternately white using Kelly on a black suit and red redwood powder dyed. And you can see a trend here on how they're making the mask because some of the material that's using to color in the mask and so forth is similar. The special thing about this old Agbodo Inye mask is most of these masks on their backs carry a single carved human head. Here, two smaller human heads. Okay, left and right from the back of the elephant mask. Overall, a good old interesting example of the, with two heads behind. With some minor age-related damage, paint rubbed off, especially in the area of the white coating on the two cracks at the bottom. So basically, this mask you can buy for fourteen hundred and fifty and fifty dollars. Okay, this is considered in the Ebo Arts. You can pause it to look up more information because I left your source right there to look it up. And that mask is also a part of a German collective. Come on, man. Now, here hey, we go. We have the Ebo. Before you go into the next mask, man, that last mask, if you see those two men at the top of the mask looking east and west, and then you factor in that it's a protection mask, right? It's looking over the village. It's looking over the community, man. That symbolism is just immaculate, but it's not something we haven't seen before. If, if you uh, are familiar with the 32nd degree symbol of Freemasonry, it's two eagles that are doing the exact same thing as that mask. And the, the explanation is exactly the same, to move east and west to spy to see what's coming. So these, these designs that our ancestors built so many years ago made it into other societies. And, and it's just crazy to see it in artistic form. Facts. Facts. Now, we're going to get into the Igbo, the Igbo again, Nigerian old helmet mask called the Akboho Mwo, if I said that correctly, which represents the spirit of a beautiful girl. A classic mask type of Igbo, of Igbo from the southeastern of Nigeria. The mask represents a beautiful girl who comes to the people from the hereafter. These masks are called the Akboho Mwo and are danced by young men in tight, colorful costumes at Thanksgiving feasts and ceremonies in honor of the ancestors, women, and earth gods. The Mwo mask represents here is especially beautiful, old, and carefully designed with a white color face through Calion, which indicates that this mask form comes from the beyond, the realm of the dead, which originally black colored decorative scars on the forehead and on both sides with black eyes, I mean black eyebrows, eyes, ears, and a small open mouth with two carved rows of teeth over a pointed chin. A classic mask type of Igbo from the southeastern of Nigeria, the mask represents a beautiful girl who comes to the people from the hereafter. Remember that I said that because it's very important to know that how these masks are designed goes back to what Kofi stated when he set this whole presentation up. All right. Now, the MO mask presented here is especially beautiful, old, and carefully designed. 
and I'm not going to go back over the specifics of this because it kind of reiterates its name, gist of everything. Now, on both sides of the hairstyle, uh, you will see some bl two black birds with red eyes, a McCartney stand, and underneath the left and the right, two small white color mask faces. Rare. At the front, the black mask hairstyle has two to uh, towering bars for wearing the mask. The lower edge of the hairstyle is finished with lines and concentric circles in relief. Overall, a very nice emo mask with an old crack behind and some age-related and coleon white. All right, now, some more additional information here. This mask is 47 centimeters. Um, and the length is about 27 centimeters, is made in the third, uh, about the third of the 20th century. Okay. I ain't gonna bore y'all with all that. Now, here's some more additional information on this particular mask. Um, and the actual source for this particular mask is well as in here. And you can purchase it today for twelve hundred dollars. This is crazy. And this mask is found in uh, uh in Austrian in a private collection, y'all. So we didn't been a German mask, we didn't been a, a Australian another mask. Where where the African mask in right. Africa, brother COVID? <laughs> Do they got any in the African exhibits? Oh, they we probably ain't got no more. Over there. <laughs> Don't look like we got no more. They stole everything we got. <laughs> <laughs> Give it back. Right. All right. Now we're gonna get into the Europe Yoruba Nigeria, okay? And uh -oh. old helmet mask depicted in the Igungun, the ancestors, the yeah. ancestral god of the Yoruba. <laughs> now, sorry, y'all, I get excited. Hey, go in, Ben. <laughs> That's right, uh, Brother Jones says, spills are flying and pseudos. It's a fact. Now, this mask with tall, big rabbit ears, helmet or cap mask of the ancestral guard at Gungu are available in various forms as a round, smooth head, as a head with a long lateral hanging plant, or in the form of presented here with the high high rabbit ears. The specialist literature can also be interpreted as elephant ears. Igungun mares are always important family clans. The purpose of their ceremonial steps is that the ancestor god Igungun in the form of the mask connects to the ancestors of the family concern. The present old object shows of Igungun helmet mask. It is carved from light, light wood, as well as yellow, black, red, and white colored with a yellow broad face and black hairstyle with characteristics large bulging Yoruba eyes, white with black pupils, ornamental scars on both cheeks and a black beard. The high rabbit ears are black, excuse me, on the outside with red, black and white colored edge bands of linear triangle and striped relief. The inside of the ears was originally red, black and white color at the back of the mask, it's a yellow and black chameleon with red eyes. You can't see it in here because I didn't add the additional emerald, but the back of his head, you'll see it. This has been taken from the people and also is held in an Austrian collection, private right. collection. <laughs> yeah. You also... Right, right. You also can pause the video here because I leave you a source of where you can get some additional information on this particular mask. And before I go on, Brother Ben. What's up, bro? Mask. What'd you say? What do you think about that mask? Oh, I love that mask, man. That's, that's uh, you know, people that don't know, that is my... Uh, that is where I do my work, uh, Egbe Gungun, uh, the Gungun Society. So, uh, you know, that mask is very interesting. I've never seen any Gungun mask like that, to be honest. But the, uh, the scarification on the mask are very, are very telling to something that's familiar to me. 
And, uh, you know, I'm actually going to have to do some more research on that mask to see what specifically the rabbit uh, has to do with Igungun, because I've never seen that. But that's a great uh, that's a great find right there. And I'm looking at your source, uh, Henry John Draywall. He is also the author of a book called uh, Gelade, which is a masquerade in Africa, kind of like a Mother's Day, in which they honor the divine feminine energy in the tradition. And they have a lot of masks in that tradition. And I'm actually trying to, uh, well, I've located the book. I just need to order it. It's a book that he wrote called Gelade. And it's, uh, it's got a lot of good information on African art on it. So good source, good mask. All right. All right, this is the last of my mask before we, uh, Big Brother Ben, bring us home is the Malinke Helmet Mask. Now, the, the Malinke people of Cameroon grasslands are closely related to their neighbors, the Bambinki and the Baman people. You may have heard the Baman people before and have similar artistic styles. The Malinke society is highly stratified by lineage, with certain royal lineages exclusively entitled to wear certain masks. Lineage masks may represent uh, persons such as the cam and gone or animals and or used principally at funerals or annual harvest festivals. The cam mask is reserved for royalty and is the highest ranking mask with Ingon, his wife, also highly ranked. Helmet masks like this one are open to non-royal lineages to use. Uh, the general region, of course, uh, in the African country of Cameroon, the ethnicity of the description, and it's a helmet mask. Uh, the maker is a known uh, agriculture celebration and funeral status is what the mask is used for. This was made somewhere around in the 80s and uh, out of wood. And uh, as of right now, there's no other material in it. This is specifically all wood. So if you take a good look at this, you see the uh, the the person at the bottom of the mask, and then you have basically individual heads at the top and the bottom centering the head shape. So uh, it's a good symbolism, especially for community. And um, we move on. Here are some additional sources that I actually use for this particular presentation. Feel free to pause the video, jot them down, and go take a look at some of your, uh, your ancestors' works that are all over the internet, um, that are all over in these particular museums and um, appreciate who you are, man. Take back a piece of your culture. And on that, I conclude my end and we'll get to Big Brother Ben. All right, all right, all right. Excellent job, Warriors. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things and then I'm going to show y'all some videos talk a little bit about the history. I'm going to break down a particular mask that Brother Sean has asked me to break down. If you look on my Facebook page, there is a mask for my profile picture. Uh, and I will break down what that mask means exactly, as well as show it here. So, African mask. We know that they're used to chase evil away from the community, purify the land, things of that nature. I did a little research and the largest, most well-known mask uh, almost in all of Africa is by the, uh, the Baga people and it's called the Nimba mask. It represents a goddess of fertility. And the bad thing about this mask uh, is, you know, it's a great tragedy of this culture that this mask isn't with the people because it's the largest in the African world. And it's uh, it's linked to Guinea. And uh, almost all the uh, all the uh, sculptures have disappeared from this village. They were either taken by missionaries, they were broken uh, by the new religions that came into the land, or they were simply abandoned by their descendants. So uh, although Guinea had a great history of mask making, uh, unfortunately, it's almost all been erased or in private collections. 
So this speaks to what we saw, you know, the continuing trend in Brother Sean's presentation. We have to hold on to our history. This is why we do what we do. Because if we do not teach the people about our history, not only will somebody else want it, somebody else will take it and they will not give it back. I went to the Cairo Museum in 2016. They had a lot of African artifacts, a lot of Egyptian artifacts, but they have nowhere as near African artifacts as the British Museum. Now we're simply talking about Egyptian artifacts here. The British Museum has 6 million Egyptian artifacts. You heard what I said, 6 million Egyptian artifacts. Now, even though the Egyptian, the native Egyptians aren't there anymore, the Egyptians that are there now have requested their stuff back. Stand up, man. Yeah, I think something that happened to his uh, internet. Okay, hold tight, family. Being a bounce back on us in a minute. Yeah, you had to pop back out and pop back in, man. Hope his thing ain't done. Froze all the way up where he can't get back on him. Just give us a few minutes, uh, family. He's having a typical. Uh, Technical difficulty. See, I might just. Uh, you see how he, how he was well. What he was referring to was that uh, a lot of the artifacts, and he's correct. Um, there's millions of artifacts the British own, especially when it comes to Kemet. When it comes to West Africa. They have a lot of our stuff, man. A lot. I mean, I mean, go look, go look and see if you you're able to contract the amount of artifacts that they got from West Africa and East Africa and other in Central Africa. It's crazy. Yeah, they have a lot of it. Um <laughs> We'll give Ben a few more minutes to see if he can jump back in, man. If not, I'll, I, uh, I guess I can show a few more masses until he jump back, uh, jump back in. But family, hit the like, uh, the like button. It's easy for us to find. If you hit the like button, it's easy for people to find the, uh, the video. So what I do is, let me see. Just bear with us, family. Just bear with us a few minutes. And then, hold on, let me my screen.
Ken is uh till we get Ben back in here, I guess I'll show a few masks that I didn't show earlier. Hold on one second. And when Ben get back in, he can jump back in. Okay. Give me just a second, Ben. All right. Well, let's jump into the uh the bimbo mask. The bimbo masks are used to carve wood and colors with red to cooler powder and dye made from cane wood trees. The eyes are typically coffee bean shaped, triangular checkerboard. And again, as I, I said earlier in a pre uh, uh when I started out the presentation, a lot of the African masks are made out of other different material, but specifically wood. And a lot of the masks that you will see uh shown, you will see the uh geometric uh design, you'll see the sim symmetric design, as well as the checkerboard and the zigzag uh designs i think the zigzag designs and the checkerboard where you see the dark uh the light color and the dark color is light and dark or uh illiterate and knowledgeable the three forms of the black of the heads represent the bibomi hairstyle the feathers are often attached to the bibomi mask but on this particular mask the uh feathers is not attached to the mask Somebody got Sorry something about to say? That, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I had some technical difficulties. I had to switch out. Yeah. Well, I I I knew something was say gonna again, happen, brother. bro. That's why I said I knew something was gonna happen. That's why I jumped. That's why I had some more slides on deck. I knew something was gonna happen. So, uh, you ready? You can go. Uh, I just wanted to uh. Boy, not to be no dead air, dead space, man. I just went on and jumped into another slide till you all uh, got back in. But go ahead. You still, you still with us, brother Ben? Brother Bean. We can't uh uh hear what you're saying. It's you it's trying to come in, but we can't hear you. We're gonna have to get our brother some good internet over there where he had over there in the Middle East over there. Pop out and pop back in real quick, bro. Ben, it, it might work. Just pop out and then pop right back in. We still can't hear you, bro, Ben. Ben, sorry about that. Just uh, <laughs> bear with us again, man. Uh, ben having some uh, major issues on his uh, on his other end. He's way at another another country, so it's internet service over there. It's kind of hard to uh, I guess hard to work right over there. I appreciate your patience. Appreciate your patience, fam. Hotel Jehudi. I need an African mask. Yeah, man. Shout out to the chat, man. Thanks to everybody for tuning in, sharing the show, um, subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe, man. We, we really appreciate the support. And um, while we while we wait on our brother to get it, get us right back on track, um, tomorrow 
um, 2 p.m. Eastern, so 1 p.m. Central. Um, we will be, hold on, let me, let me share my screen real quick. Oh, you already, <laughs> yeah, we will oh. be, um, if you can see my screen, we will be here tomorrow. We will be here representing and, uh, we will get into this. We will get into welcome to Yoruba land part two. Um, and uh we will specifically touch on a few topics at 1 p.m central 2 p.m eastern and that you know we learn something tomorrow together and uh we're gonna deal with some primary source material primary and secondary source uh material from from eyewitness accounts and uh we're gonna talk about a little history uh of Yoruba. I mean, a lot of times, like Ben said earlier, we get into the Orishas or we get into the Neteru and um, we tend to focus on the spiritual side of of Yoruba, uh, Ile Ife, and we don't really talk too much about the, the history of it. So we're gonna, we're gonna touch on a few things and we're gonna cover some ground, just a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit, because we got so much to learn and it's not all going to be in one presentation. It's going to be a stream of things that we're going to try to tie into. And we're going to take a little bit of our history back one day at a time, one step at a time, uh, one proverb at a time. And uh, we're just going to continue to build. Like I said, like Kofi, I always say, you know, as I learn, we all learn. And uh, so appreciate you guys for uh you know, uh, sticking with us. I mean, you could be doing anything. It's Saturday. Uh, you could be sleep. Uh, you could be mowing the lawn or you could be shopping or uh, out to eat or whatever you may be doing. You might be doing some of those things and still tuned in. So uh, we highly appreciate it. But Kofi, if you want to go ahead and jump back into uh, a couple of examples of the mask, man, uh, that you have that you didn't get over, you know, uh, yeah. I'd be glad to. Yeah, I'm going to do it in a second, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and show this real quick. Uh, you kind of already was on it. I kind of wanted to, which I may do it again. I may go a little further because I, I may do another show tonight. I'm not sure, but it, is my my screen sharing? Can you see my screen? Um, I see your, uh, I just see the symbol. Uh, no, you're not sharing. All right, hold on one second. All right. Okay. There you go. Yeah, no. All right. Hold on. I can see it. All right. Um, let me go back down. It's just just touching on what you were touching on a while ago. Real quick, I had to go down, go back through it real. And if you missed uh, my part of the presentation, you can always go back and look at the presentation. Uh, this was talking about the makers of the mass who make the mass, the ceremonies uh, behind making the mass, the material making the mass, uh, the scarification marks on the mass and so forth. Um, but I got the time wrong. But uh, as my brother uh, stated earlier, uh, welcome to Yoruba Land Part 2, which is by my Akarini which Akarini just means brother, uh, which will be tomorrow, May the 27th. And I got 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, but it'd be 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1 p.m. Central uh, uh, Central Standard Time. That's tomorrow. Then uh, on Monday, you got me. I'll be coming back with African, uh, uh, African marriage, the most important ceremony in Africa. It is the most important ceremony in Africa. I'll be re reiterating a few things dealing with the rights of uh, the uh, African rights of, of passage, uh, because the uh, right, the rights of birth passage, the um, the uh, the adult uh, passage, uh, as well as the uh, uh, passage, it, it all uh, combined in together. So I'm gonna touch on those three specifically, but I'm going to give all of the rights of passage and then we'll come back and deal with those three and then we'll deal with marriage and go into why I say marriage is the most important ceremony uh, uh, in Africa. So we'll uh, 
deal with that on um, Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Also be looking forward for um, uh, Brother Ben. Um, he has a presentation coming soon. I don't know when exactly, but it's coming soon. It's called the Poro Society Presentation. It is the presentation, it's the Secret Man uh, presentation. Uh, uh, it is the, you have the Bundo, or you have the Sandy Society, and you have the Poro Society. You have the male society, the male society is called the Poro. The female so uh, secret society is called the Sandy Society. Uh, those who may have missed that presentation is on this channel as well as my Kofi Faisal channel. So either channel, you can uh, go and revisit that presentation. It's a pretty good presentation, the Sandy pre uh, Bundo slash Sandy uh, Secret Woman Society presentation. So be looking forward for the male presentation side of it by our brother Ben, which is uh, coming soon, I hope, uh, real soon. Uh, also, man, too, while we on here, I want to give a shout out, man, to uh, the Gullah, the Gullah, the uh, the Gullah people, man. Um, they really been showing uh, the Mossy Warrior uh, channel some love. They've been subscribing. They've been inboxing me a little bit. I did a presentation on who is the Gullah slash Gullah uh, people. Um, also, as well as the Black Seminole, who the Black Seminoles are nothing but the Gullah people who escaped it from South Carolina, I mean, North Carolina. No, yeah, North Carolina. And joined to St. Augusta, which is Florida. And which was a safe haven in the uh, late 17th uh, century, who became the Black Seminole. So, uh, uh, shout out to the Gullah people. Uh, and I got two more presentations that I'm going to do specifically dealing with the Gullah people. I'm going to go into the Angola uh, prison here and touch it with the Gullah people in Central Africa, as, the, as well as the Gullah people in uh, the United States, and touch on the. Um, uh, uh, what is it? The Seminole, Seminole Negro uh, Scouts. Those Seminole Negro Scouts that actually escaped, or well, actually went into uh, Oklahoma, then went into uh, Mexico. No, went into Texas and then Mexico, and then later went back into Texaco and then served in the United States uh, uh, Cavalry um, because uh, the Gala, the Gula people became warriors. Uh, and develop uh, this warrior spirit and this uh, uh, military technique as they was fighting in the Second Seminole War. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, man, I guess um, uh, he's not going to come back in. You think he's going to come back in, uh, Sean? If not, man, we can just go ahead, man, and just shut it down. Um. Man, that's your call, brother. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's what. We'll, yeah, that's what we're, we'll do. we're gonna uh, remember, man. We're gonna continue to keep bringing uh, bringing information to the people, and we're gonna continue to, uh, you know, keep exposing everyone to our traditions and our customs. Period. Point blank. So this is not the ending. Um, as you can see, he, uh, brother Ben, he's done a mask presentation. Um. He trying to fix it now, uh, Kofi. So we're gonna write. Let's write it out a little bit. And um, okay. he's done a mask presentation. Kofi has done a mask presentation. Um, I just did a little brief um, presentation on some things. And you know, really, we can. In even though our primary focus is West Africa, here we also have connection with Kemet and and so forth and Central Africa. So you know, the whole continent, just Africa in general. But we can go into different parts of the continent and we're going to see a lot of similarities or uh, ritualistic similarities in the making of the mask and the energy that goes into it and what the mask resembles from from protection of family, protection of children, uh, the the gungun, uh, the ancestors, uh, just, you know, the community. The uh, Babaluas, it's all kind of thing. These masks have significant meaning to us. Um, they're not evil. And most people are seen to look at them as evil. Most people first time probably really acknowledging the mask is is uh, when they seen the movie Black Panther. Um, other than that, 
uh, symbolically, it just meant some ugly evil and looked like it was African. You know, it's like it, it had a negative uh, connotation to it or whatever or what have you. And um, that's bad. That's the image that the Western world has painted on African spirituality and culture. Um, it made us demonize our own culture and run away from it instead of run to it. But if you're trying to colonize the mind and the spirit of a person, those are the things that you embed in them to make them not like it. Just like if you see reality TV today, um, there was uh, an episode on uh, one of them little messy TV shows that Siobhan watches. Um, I don't know if it's uh, Housewives of Atlanta. Whatever they show in Atlanta with the doctors, that's it where um one of the sisters took another sister into into a voodoo shop they were in new orleans and um they went into a voodoo shop and the lady didn't want to go in there she refused to go in there she says i'm a christian woman i ain't going near no devil nothing she said it's evil in there and i was taught to stay away from evil because i'm a good christian woman and um the lady was like, well, this is who you are. This is Africa. This is a part of who you are. And then the, the man who shop they went into, which was a white man, um, they went into his shop. And uh, and he pretty much was echoing what the sister had already told. And he was like, well, this is this is your culture. This is what you come from. Uh, but Brother Ben is back, though. Let's see if we can, you know, we can get Brother Ben for a few more minutes with us. All right, man. God damn. <laughs> we gonna, we gonna get you some internet over there. We're gonna get you, we gonna get you some, we're gonna get you some old megabytes, some gigs. We're gonna get you that over there, man. You need that over there. I need a whole damn satellite. Just go on put it <laughs> in the mail. <laughs> God damn, man. All right. Shit. <laughs> Where was I, man? Shit. You ended uh, at um, Brit the British Museum. That's the last thing y'all. I was talking like ten minutes after that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you talking about the mask the too? Museum. You talking about the mask? Go ahead. Uh, for not knowing where I was cut off, the British Museum has six million Egyptian artifacts. They're not gonna give them back to the Egyptian people, uh, because they told the excuse they told them was. It may get damaged in the move and it's safer with us. So the, the point is hold on to your culture, guard your culture, protect your culture, because people will take your culture and not give it back to you unless that unless if you give them some money. We all know how capitalistic the European culture is, so just keep that in mind. Uh okay. So I want to talk about the mask that's on my profile picture. It's called a Mago, uh, a Mago mask, a Mago Oro mask. And I'm going to go into a little bit of what Oro is. So you get the, uh, you get the gist of what I'm, what the mask represents before I show you the mask. So bear with me just a second. I'm actually reading out of a book. It's called African Narratives of Orisha Spirits and Other Deities, Stories from West Africa and the Diaspora, A Journey into the Realm of the Deities of the Spirits, Mysticism, Spiritual Roots of Ancestral Wisdom by Alex Kuko. For those that have very quickly, this is the book. So that's how it looks. I got that. All right, Oro. Oro is a spiritual force that dwells over justice and retribution in the Yoruba society. It is also a deity with origins traced to Ifun, the town of Orisha Olofun, who is deeply rooted in the town of Ashayan. He is said to have come to earth with Obabaluaye and Ogun, and like them, he became immortal. He is also known and worshiped as a deity who is the god of medicine in Ile Ife, 
Oro is considered to be the right arm of the Ogbani. Now, the Ogbani society is like our court system in Africa or in the Yoruba people specifically. He is, a, he is an earth god who is one of the sons of Oduduwa. Oro, as a deity, is said to be worshipped more in his spiritual state than in his material one. Sacrifices to Oro are offered to him in a spiritual state, never when he is in possession of a human body. Sacrifices include the typical animals in Africa. Okay. Trying to get to the... Okay, the Oro, the coat of Oro is known as the most powerful secret society, which is an executive government branch of the Egba people. It has political functions in its conjunction with the Agmani and the Osugo society. The Agmani society is closely connected with Oro. If during a trial or criminal case, the members of the Agmani society decide that the accused person is guilty and should be condemned to death, the person is immediately handed to Oro, who will carry carry out the sentence. Members of the oral society are mainly concerned with spirits and ancestors and death. Last thing I want to mention out of this is for all you Fele Kute fans, the godfather of Afrobeat, it is said that Fele Kute is, is said to have reclaimed and invoked the original female oro. Now, let me show you what I am talking about. Because Oro is one of those societies that there are no festivals for. There's no Oro the imagery that occur There's no Oro masquerades. It's that secret. So let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, yeah, we can see it. Well, we did see it. it um, we can see it. Okay. All right. Well, just listen up to this. On a Mongol mask creates or visualizes the universe that needs to abide by the rules and regulations of the Oro society and the Oshubo society. This is a vision of traders and buyers and consumers and mothers and children and kings and warriors in a sense this uh, kind of world of, of the yoruba community both in west africa and also returned yoruba sons and daughters who had been taken into captivity and taken into bondage but who managed to find their ways back home all right if you heard that, that brother, I mean, that uh, colonizer that was speaking, he is the same guy from the book that I was talking about and the same reference uh, from what Brother Sean had. That is him in the flesh. He's a professor at the University of Wisconsin. What he's talking about is how the Oro mask appears. It's disposition is that kind of that phrase we say all the time. And I'm going to pull it up again for those that didn't see it in the video or need to see it again. When we say standing on the shoulders of ancestors, this is what we're talking about. Can, can you guys see the mask? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So this is what we're talking about, standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. These people on top are numerous, and they have numerous positions in society. They're kings, teachers, hunters, as he said. So when we say standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, we didn't just make that up in America. That's a real African concept. And it tells a story if you look at the mask about us, us in the diaspora, us returning home and being welcomed home. So when people give you that narrative that Africans just hate people from America, this is proof that they don't because that's what this mask represents. Specifically Africans returning home that were trapped in uh, the Americas, South America, 
and North America, coming home and being welcomed. The bird on the top symbolizes the flight because birds fly, right? And the journey you take back home. It also represents uh, an ancestral purpose because birds are very uh, popular in ancestral worship and as well as African spirituality. Sure. So when we talk about Oro, Oro comes out at night. There are many people that are Yoruba people that have never seen that mask. There are many people that are Yoruba people that have never seen Oro, specifically women. Why? Because it is forbidden for a woman to see Oro. Because when Oro comes out, he's coming out for a purpose. And I don't mean a purpose of teaching or anything. He's coming to basically punish somebody that basically did something against the rules of the community. Oro only comes out at night. Oro has a specific call. And it's used by what they call bull uh, hoarders. They make a whistling sound, and that alerts the village that Oro is coming, and women need to get in the house, as well as small children. Only the priest of Oro are out during this time. And that's just the nature of this energy. Why do I have that mask <laughs> as a profile pic, you might ask? Because recently I found out that I had Oro members in my ancestry. So that is why I put it up there. There's a saying in, in Yoruba, it's called Obinrin Ki Mi Oro, which basically means a woman to see or take part of Oro. And if a woman knows something about Oro, she must pretend like she does not. So this was our justice system in Africa. This was our way of keeping order. Now, as a part of Ifa tradition, when people tell you things about Ifa, they should tell you a reference just like they tell you about anything else. So if anyone is familiar with Odus, you can go to the Odu Awarin Ashean and Awarin Meji to read about Oro. If you were listening when I was reading about Oro, it said that it was born in a village called Ashean. That's why it's connected to that Odu. So I'm gonna tell you a story that comes out of that Odu. Because this is a specific story. It's told in many, it's told in many uh, egg bays. And it's something that, you know, will paint the picture for you. So a long time ago, there was a queen named Adeola. And Adeola lived next to a monkey. Before I, before I finish this story, this is purely allegorical. This never happened. <laughs> so the monkey was a very aggressive type of energy that inhabited him. So he used to watch her when she would be in the garden. The monkey one day took advantage of her sexually and she became pregnant. So to get him back, she trapped him in sort of a booby trap that she created. When he was trapped, he died. So the baby that she had never knew that her father was this monkey. This boy that she had became a king of the village. He had many wives. He was very successful, but none of his wives could get pregnant. His wives couldn't get pregnant because well, I'll get to that in a minute. But he went to a Bible out to find out why his wives couldn't get pregnant. 
And the Babalao told him that his father was very angry and very hurt and upset that he wasn't given a proper burial. He didn't know who his father was, but his mother finally came clean and told him what happened. They said that his father was very apologetic and just wanted to be a part of the lineage. So in order for him to have children, he had to give his father a proper burial. And Oro was called to assist in this, in this, uh, in this action. So they went through the village with the sacred call, warning people, Oro is coming, Oro is coming, Oro is coming. And with Oro, the other element that's a part of Oro is burials. In every burial, Oro is a part of it. Because Oro is the brother of Igungun. So he assisted with the burial, and the king was able to have children. So this is a very intricate part of the Yoruba tradition. Brother Sean asked me to break this mass down specifically. Uh, and I knew that, you know, it'd be good for the people. And yes, this society does exist today, although it is not something that is in abundance like Orisha or Igungun. You have to go deep into Africa to find the Oro priest, just like uh, an Egbe priest. But the mass tells the story that's very, very important. When you look at the mask and you see all of the people in the village supporting Oro and Oro supporting it, you understand the importance of the order and the justice that must prevail in the society and in the village for us to basically exist as Africans. There must be order. So when, when people say things like Africans didn't have a judicial system, Africans didn't have uh, a society, this is proof that they are lying. Africans had all that and more. We had our own way of dealing with things. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that little tidbit about Oro. Uh, I wish I could. I'm going to try to post the link. Nah, you can't post links in the chat. All right. So um, if you get at me on Facebook, I can send you some links uh, about it. But um, the final thing I want to say is to understand the art of a particular African society, you have to understand their cosmology. And you have to be able to trace their origins within that cosmology. So in Ifa, you have to know that uh, Iwa Pele or good or gentle character is directly linked to their supreme being Oludamare, which is a link to enabling Ashe throughout the universe, which is linked to right. Obatala molding, which is linked to the saying that they have about art within the Yoruba tradition, which is may Obatala fashion for us a good work of art. And mm. there's twofold to that saying. One, when they're carving or uh, making things. Other, when women have children. Because they look at children as, as works of art. May Obatala fashion for us a good work of art. So, yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, that's all I got. Um, real quick, uh, you you told a story uh, uh, of one of the old dudes. Can you tell? Uh, I know people may not know what the old dudes are. They may not know that there are two hundred and fifty six uh, old dudes. You got sixteen major and two hundred and forty minor. Could you kind of elaborate on that real quick, just to give some people some clarity on what the old dude? Because you told a story, and and again, it's it's not to be taken literally. Right. Uh, okay, so Odus in Yoruba tradition are energy patterns, and everything has a pattern within the Yoruba tradition. 
And the way they decipher these patterns is 16 major Odoos. Out of 16 major Odoos, there are 240 more combinations, which makes 256 Odoos. And it is said that no situation on earth or in heaven escapes these 256 Odoos. All these Odoos are linked to an Orisha. All these Odoos are linked to what we call a Patake or an Itan, which uh, is basically stories, sacred stories that t are designed to teach you lessons. They're not uh, literal in any sense, but they do teach you lessons that you can carry forward and improve your life. Right, I just wanted people to get some clarity on what the the old dudes or the old dudes were. Um, you uh, you mentioned um, in order to know more about the mask and the story that's rooted in uh, their cosmology, and you mentioned E.Y. Pele, uh, and E.Y. Riri, -ri, which if you go to one of the old dudes, if I'm correct. And one of the old dudes, it tells a story about Iwa, and it tells well, still a story about Iwa uh, actually being married, I mean, actually being the daughter of, of Odemari. Yes, you, you'll find uh, a story where Iwa Pele is not just a concept, but an actual, uh, it takes the form of a person for the sake of the story, and that it is. Yes you know, the daughter of the Supreme Being. And that's right. to tell you how important good character is in African traditions. You know, and that's embedded in their art. Exactly. You know, they, when, when, you oh, make, yeah. when you make these masks and carvings and figurines and everything like that, that takes so much dedication, study and time and meticulous things to do. You can't take no shortcuts. Because they use the mask, you know, I'll cheap material or nothing like that, because these masks stand for something that's greater than yourself. So yeah. the fact that you're making a mask teaches you something about life because you can't take those shortcuts in life. You can't cheapen yourself in life. So that's why they said uh, in your presentation, I believe that the maker of the mass is deeply rooted in the spiritual nature of the of the culture because he understands what it takes to make the mask and he understands how the mask is linked to his life exactly and the the uh when you're dealing with what you we, we talk about ey pele good character uh is is rooted in the cosmology dealing with the old Demari. If you go back to those makers of the mask, those artists that make the mask, they had to be skilled in what we call the agungu. And when you're dealing with uh, certain things that went on in a society, those makers, those makers that made the mask, uh, and you had elders that also did a ceremony amongst the mask, but they were also, you, the mask was used as an interface between the spiritual world in the physical physical world where if there was problems in the society where the ancestors left uh uh rules and guidelines that's rooted in good character that's rooted in ey Pele, they will use these masks and different masquerades uh where they would come what we would call uh possessed and or, or, be, or what they were called mounted. They become mounted and the ancestors, uh, the mask will serve as an interface bet between the spiritual world and the ancestors will come and reiterate good character or settle a dispute or if a king couldn't resolve an issue that was going on, they will do certain ceremonies and rituals uh, with the mask in order to um, for the ancestors um, to pass down uh, the ruling or to continue to reiterate the laws that they have left back uh, left behind to continue to push good character, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. I would definitely agree with that. Right. Mass play an intricate role in African traditions. That's why they're they're abundant, you know. 
they're abundant in our society because they're very important. And uh, Sister Monica, thank you for telling me that I can, in fact, post links uh, in the chat. So that is what I am doing now. So y'all can check these links. These Now, they're very short links because you will not find a lot of information on this particular society for free. <laughs> so uh, I had to, you know, I had to really not only pay money, but I had to uh, hit up all my contacts and basically, you know, talk to some elders for that information. So, you know, it's something where you re I, you really got to put the time in on some of this stuff in Africa because, unfortunately, it's not re readily available to us and partly because it's still being guarded. And you have to basically prove yourself worthy for some of this stuff to get this information. And that's just basically the surface things about this society. There's more of that I don't know. And unless I become a member, I won't know, <laughs> you know. So that's just the nature of studying Africa in general, though. Well, shoot, that's all I have. I think we had some questions in the chat. Uh, Brother Zane Montego said, is that mask on the cover? of the book no i haven't seen it on the cover of any book um the and and to to piggyback off of what sean said uh this particular the particular mask that i showed is in a pennsylvania museum so at least it's in the united states but it's very expensive uh and it and it was original it was originally taken by um uh, slave traders and then brought to the united states now they do have the name of the original carver in the mask his name is orabanju of itu meko and that is and he they it said it had been carved around the 18th century so um that is the origin of that particular mask Let me see if we got, uh, if you have any questions, please post them. You know, we always like to interact with the people. If not, uh, you know, we can definitely shut it down. Uh, but thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for coming out and supporting the Mossy Warrior Clan, as you always do. We appreciate the support. We appreciate people that are interested in our African heritage. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue to keep this thing going, continue to keep this thing rolling. And uh, more topics. If y'all got anything y'all want us to cover, uh, you can hit any of us on Facebook. Say, hey, I, you know, what about this? Do you have any information about this? And, you know, we can cover it in a later date. But, um, we appreciate y'all, man. We appreciate everybody that tunes in and gives us support because without people listening, you know, it's null and void. My wife says Odabo, which means goodbye. <laughs> so I guess that means I have to go. <laughs> so uh brother Kofi, you see how that work? You see? <laughs> <laughs> see that... Yeah, I see how that work. I, I see, see how, how that work. work. <laughs> brother Sean <laughs> laughing he <you> know. <laughs> ah. Oh man. Okay, we well, yeah. do have one, one question. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one question before we go. What do you think about Mossy Diviners? Uh, I've watched 
maybe two videos on Mossy Diviners and uh Mossy Divination does not go outside of the regular divination that I see in most of West Africa. Uh they do divination, you know, it was crazy because the first time somebody sent me a video on Mossy's divination if I didn't, if I didn't know it was Masi, I would swear it was Yoruba because it was that similar, you know, uh, just the things that they do that I've been a part of. It looked almost exactly Yoruba. Uh, the mask that they have with the cattle horns, let me tell you some Masi masks are just beautiful to me in general. I like the cattle horn mask, but you got to know that the cattle horn masks are used in their rituals um, when they come out of the uh, groves for their, it's basically an Igungun festival. It's basically a masquerade. And it's the same concept of the forest spirit protecting the village. Um, they have other masks like Brother Sean had in the beginning of his presentation. Uh, they're called the Bois mask, B-W-A. And the specific measurements on the mask and the, the number of the measurements that it is means something. All of those numbers mean something. And it's just incredible that our ancestors had that foresight back then. So uh, does it have anything to do with harbor or cattle worship? I'm not that familiar with the story of oh, Harthor cattle worship no i don't believe so but uh i would have to dig into the story of the mass to see if uh it's relatable to uh het heru or hathor in uh with the horns is he talking about yeah, the one that i shot with the well most of the, like one the, well one of the on on the uh my, my presentation the horns it represents it, it it represents it has something to do with the women wearing them doing um the harvest you know but uh, when they harvest they 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 put on a they put on a masquerade at that time and then they put on um, uh they wear the mask after they reap the benefits of the harvest they go back the women wear the mask and then it also represents mullet mullet for them represents uh uh dough and it represents beer you know, and you know, mm -hmm. these are dope things where you can make bread and for the eat, also beer for them to drink, and also they use this this beer as an offering to uh the ancestors or offering into uh those that may uh be living because you can also pour a libation not only for the dead for those that are living, or you can pour a libation for those that in a particular reason, like dealing with Ifa, you make you can pour you can pour that uh beer the liquid for uh the orishas or the luau's for the fun people that may practice Buddha like so, different alcohol uh-huh <laughs> yeah you so know it said it said mm -hmm. that gin is the alcohol of the choice for the ancestors um yep ogun also likes gin some orishas yep. like vodka uh some orishas mm -hmm. like palm wine and palm wine right. is very hard to find. So when you find some palm wine, buy a lot of it. <laughs> keep, it keep it from a bottle, though. Keep it from a bottle. Yeah, a bottle. I don't like uh, <laughs> not, not, nothing alcohol related. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and, and the reason for that is directly tied into the creation story when you get into the cosmology of Ifa. So uh, everything is always is always a reason for things in african traditions you know if uh if the particular energy or village is called something it's because it's linked to a story you know so it's just it's our job as researchers and scholars to bring that out you know no yeah. okay uh i'm gonna have to look into that mercy thing uh brother voodoo drew um uh, Cause I'm not that well versed in the mercy, but I do know we're talking about East Africa when we're talking about the mercy. Um, some people say that the mercy are some of the oldest Africans on the planet. 
So, um, yeah, I have to look into that. But yeah, family, we're gonna go ahead and uh and shut it down. Appreciate y'all coming out, man. Uh as always, man, Alafia Mandala Bivi Fahudie, which basically means peace, power, and African liberation. You know, it's brother Black Panther, brother Kofi, brother Sean, you know, we're gonna keep it coming, man. Spears is flying. And pseudos is crap. <laughs> But we gonna end it out. I'm gonna share my screen and go out with the little video. Uh, little video. Uh, hold on a second. Is my screen sharing, y'all? Can you see my screen? Yep. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, out there. Yeah, I'll see you here. That button say live, have me. Yeah. 